Hello, and welcome to the Who Do You Think You Are module. This week, we begin our last set of individual case studies, this time exploring the relationship between culture and landscapes and how that has been presented in the historiography of those subjects. But before we move into smaller groups and study individual case studies, I want to give you a wider historiographical context and explore some of the wider themes that will allow you to place your case studies into the historiography. So I thought that a good place to begin to explore these ideas, a place that really is the midpoint where culture and landscape intersects, is Uluru, otherwise known as Ayers Rock. The reason I've picked this is because the Aboriginals of Australia have an intense spiritual relationship with geographic parts of their landscape, including Uluru itself, but also different lakes, watering holes, even individual trees. There is significance spiritually placed on these areas that makes it important to them, and they base their entire culture around these areas. And it was really their attachment to their geographic landscape that created such a long protracted colonial experience for them. For those of you who don't know about Australian history, Britain turns up in the late 18th century and tries to begin to colonize the area. However, when they start taking areas of land that are important to the natives, there is a fierce response. And the Australian frontier wars, as they are known, last for well over a century, which just goes to show how important the landscape can be in shaping a culture. And in the pre-colonial period, all the way through colonial Australia and post-colonial Australia, Uluru has become a symbol for the importance of the geographic landscape in shaping history. And not just the history, but the way that we study history and how that has changed can be seen in historians' approach to this process. Uh, the history wars are, as they are known, are one of the most lively debates that exist in Australian history. And you have two main points of view. The traditional three cheers argument that suggests that the Brit when the British arrived, they were trying to provide infrastructure and moral guidance to the natives. And that has really been challenged in revisionist history through the black armband argument that suggests that the British's attempt to take areas of significance away from them amounts to a cultural genocide. And that such a large part of Aboriginal culture is wrapped up in the Australian physical landscape. And this uncomfortable relationship between studying geography and history has existed within academic research for some time. One of the earliest attempts to understand the relationship between geography and history was in 1932 in a conference organized by the London School of Economics, who wanted to define a new field of study known as historical geography. Because before that point, history and geography had really been two separate studies, two completely um, unattached fields. In fact, before the 20th century, history was essentially a study of white politics in Europe. However, as new fields of study and interest became more popular, such as women's studies and uh, the understanding of marginalized groups, interdisciplinary approaches began to be introduced and geography and history were natural partners in this process. However, in the 1932 conference, 
very little concrete outcome came out of this. And the subject and relationship between history and geography is still deeply contested to this day. If we look at the last decade or two, there are still enormous amounts of articles and journals which try and establish the boundaries between the two disciplines. Um, and something that is central to this process was outlined in an article by Linda Nash in 2005, and it's called The Agency of Nature or The Nature of Agency. And agency is going to be a central theme over the next few weeks. So I just want to quickly define what I mean by agency. Agency simply is an action or an intervention producing a particular effect. And as historians, we heavily focus on the actions and interventions of people and what the result of human action is, not just on the environment, but on each other. However, it has been proposed that nature itself and the physical world has an agency. The example I've put on this slide is canals carved by the agency of running water. And this idea of agency and the clashing agency of man and the world that man inhabits has become a controversial topic because many believe that um, a non-sentient being can't have agency. So how can a waterfall have agency? It doesn't mean, it doesn't intend to do anything. It just produces a response and an intervention by merely existing. And by that logic, the human, the human world is the true agency. So I would advise reading Linda Nash's article because she explores, it's only a couple of pages and it really succinctly uh, summarizes these debates that surround the agency of the world and agency of people. I'll put the link to this on Moodle along with other, along with other journals at, from environmental history, which is essentially an extension of human geography that outline the major themes surrounding both agency and the relationship between history and geography. And I want to give an example of the complicated relationship between the two, because for a long time, I myself would have identified as an Atlantic historian, an expert in the field of the Atlantic, the physical interface in which goods, people, ideas and services were exchanged and the role that the Atlantic played in that. Uh, the dominant eminent economic system of the 18th century was the triangular trade route between Europe, Africa and Central, South and North America. And the Atlantic played a crucial role in linking those physical regions up. And the multiculturalism that has formed as a result of that was solely dependent on crossing the Atlantic, which are clumsily outlined with the red line um, on the right hand image on this slide. And the towns and cities that border the Atlantic were transformed in the 18th and 19th century especially in Europe and the Caribbean, where cities and towns began to form as a result of the economic transactions that were taking place. So geography and history clearly has a strong relationship. And um, I'll give an example of how the landscape of the world influenced an entire city. And I apologize to the students who do my Liverpool module because they will have already seen this slide, but it's a good indicator of culture and landscape. Liverpool is fully founded around the River Mersey. And the River Mersey is important because it is an access point to the Atlantic world and the economic systems that were emerging in the 18th and 19th century. The entire port town of Liverpool is essentially geared towards accessing those new markets. So it's geographical landscape, it's location, 
dominates the infrastructure of the town. Ports are built, ships are built there. You get immigration in huge numbers, especially from Ireland. The population of Liverpool goes from 6,000 to 80,000. And that is so heavily as a result of its access to the Atlantic world. And it's not just the physical infrastructure of Liverpool that changes because of its geographic position. It is the politics and culture of the town that changes as well. What you get in late 18th century Liverpool is pro-slavery MPs are consistently voted in. Slavery is very popular in Liverpool. The whole town, opposite to its uh, image today, was very conservative. And the reason that Liverpool's MPs, such as Richard Pennant, Bamba Gascoigne the Younger and Bernard Strait Tarleton were pro-slavery is because the entire town of Liverpool's economy was based on it. And the reason the economy was based on slavery is because of its geographic location. So you can see how its early position in the Atlantic world influenced its infrastructure, which in turn influenced its culture and its politics. So, geogra so geographers would argue that the landscape and the geographic world was the dominant feature in shaping Liverpool's culture. However, there are many people who would disagree with this. Um, and I'm going to contrast Liverpool's experience with uh, the experience you see in the West Midlands and Birmingham and what historians of the West Midlands might say is more important. I think to begin with, the geography and landscape of the Midlands played an important role in the formation of the early town in the 14th century, which naturally became a metalworking centre because of the natural resources available to people in the area. You had the Forest of Arden and the River Ray, which would both be useful in keeping uh, the fires of industry going and cooling metal. You had coal fields in South Staffordshire and Worcestershire. You had um, iron, easy access to iron ores. So Birmingham's early foundation was heavily linked to its landscape. However, its culture drastically changes over the following few centuries. And contrasted to Liverpool, it becomes anti abolitionist. I mean, it becomes an abolitionist centre, apologies. It is against slavery. And you have a strong enlightenment movement that forms. You have people like Matthew Bolton, uh, James Watt, and um, Erasmus Darwin, who you can see on the right of your screen, who's the grandfather of Charles Darwin. And this enlightened culture that permeates Birmingham and becomes really important movement nationally has little to do with the geography of Birmingham. And historians of Birmingham, such as Carl Chin and Malcolm Dick, would suggest that this has nothing to do with the geography and it is human agency that defines the Birmingham experience. Although human geographers would argue that without the early metal workers, you wouldn't have a manufacturing culture, which means rich manufacturers wouldn't have been in the area. So there is disagreement about whether ge uh, geographic agency or human agency is the dominant feature in towns and cities and their histories. But it makes sense that early settlements are dominated by people who have to adapt to their landscape. And as time continues, the landscape becomes less important and human agency becomes dominant. However, these days we are seeing an early shift back to the importance of the natural world's impact on us as humans through climate change. And the culture of the debates around climate change as well science, no recognized scientific body disagrees with the idea that climate change is a thing. But you have vitriolic arguments from uh, anti-climate change people about changes that should be made that might affect 
the politics and economy of the world. So once again, we are seeing the emergence of the agency of the world, if you believe that exists. And through this, the next few weeks, we'll be exploring your ideas about the world and the culture that exists within it and what has really shaped the human experience more. There are six areas of landscape research that exist at the moment. Um, we'll be focusing on two of them primarily in the lecture. One, uh, as you can see on this slide, I've outlined them. One, landscapes are shaped by the connections and importantly, disconnections between people and their environment. And the second main issue will be landscapes are undergoing changes at different rates with a multiplicity of driving forces, processes, actors, and outcomes. We will touch on the other ideas, but these are the two that we will focus mainly on. And to understand uh, what is now coined as environmental history, um, which is basically an extension of human geography, although still by comparison and marginal fields compared to other types of history, uh, to understand these issues, I want you to read something before we meet in the big group seminar. And that is Sorlin and Ward's The Problem of the Problem of Environmental History, a rereading of the field. This is a really good explanation of the emergence of env environmental history and the different debates that exist. So it's 24 pages. Make sure you give yourself enough time to read this because we'll be discussing it at length in the seminar. And I look forward to hearing your opinions and thoughts on the relationship between culture and landscapes. Thank you.